Greetings, this is Ra on the Encyclopedia team. It is with great pleasure we have Professor Gregory Hicks joining us for this interview. Thank you very much for coming. Well, you're welcome. It's good to be with you. <laughs> so, Professor Hicks, before we dive in, our audiences would love to get to know you a bit better. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Well, I'm uh, originally from California. I was raised in Southern California in my education. Um, I went to a small college in Santa Barbara, California, but I did my graduate studies in public health uh, with a focus in epidemiology and physiology and nutrition at Loma Linda University School of Public Health. And Loma Linda, California is about 70 miles east of Los Angeles. And um, my, my research um, at, at Loma Linda were, was two, twofold. One was for my master's thesis was uh, nutritional epidemiology, looking at the role of um, health behaviors, in particular dietary, physical activity on blood pressure, um, obesity, and, um, uh, and, and looking at those interactions. So uh, that, was, that was how I got my start. And then my doctoral thesis was looking at the role of physical activity or exercise in the treatment and prevention of coronary heart disease or ischemic heart disease, as it's often uh, known globally. Um, following my time at, at uh, Loma Linda, I did my postdoctoral uh, fellowship in physiology, but with a focus on exercise physiology, mainly in a clinical environment at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis University, in St. Louis, um, Missouri. And it was there that I really got very interested in the role of physical activity as both preventive and also a rehabilitative um, uh, uh, therapy, therapy. So I did about, for about eight years, I did clinical research. I was affiliated with a large multi-specialty clinic after I left St. Louis um, in the Department of Cardiology. So I did most of my work uh, up to that point in my career, very early in my career, on applications of clinical physiology as it relates to exercise and, and heart disease. Um, it was while I was doing that that I became more interested in, in getting back to my roots in public health and epidemiology and um, with, uh, with the support of some of the uh, faculty there and, and clinicians, I was able then to do, be a part of a community study, um, which led me to, to want to pursue more fully um, epidemiology of, of chronic diseases and particularly the health behaviors of physical activity and nutrition. And so I ended up uh, applying to a program at the National Centers for Disease Control uh, in Atlanta, um, Georgia. And uh, I, I, I was accepted into that program. I applied twice. The first time I didn't get in. Um, and the second time I, I got into what's called the Epidemic Intelligence Service. It's a two-year applied training program in, in epidemiology. And I was assigned to the Behavioral Epidemiology and Evaluation Branch, where we were looking at health behaviors of which specifically I was interested in and was assigned in physical activity. So that that sort of set my career, and, and I spent most of my career, over 20 years at CDC. And initially I started, um, you know, I drew on my clinical background uh, in looking at the physiology of exercise and what it does both uh, metabolically as well as cardiovascularly wise. And then I was able to um, uh, apply that to uh, my epidemiology training at, at CDC. Um, so I, for, for a number of years, I, I was part of what's called uh, the surveillance unit. We, we looked at surveys of um, chronic disease risk factors, one of which was physical activity. But after about 10 or 15 years of that, I became more interested to say, okay, what can we change behavior? We're it's great to describe that, oh yes, physical inactivity is, leads to risk factors or is a risk factor for chronic diseases like coronary heart disease and type two diabetes. Uh, certainly it's related to energy balance and re regarding um, you know, obesity um, and certainly 
cardi carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. Those are the things I studied as a physiologist and to see the, the numbers um, and uh, in particularly the proportion of people who were inactive in the United States in particular, but also globally, that uh, this was a serious issue. And so became more interested in interventions, community-based interventions. And that's where I, um, I kind of finished my career at CDC. I put in a little over 20 years as, uh, as, as uh, in the public health service. And then I came to the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga and continued that work with, um, but doing it more regionally focused rather than nationally. And, uh, and so more recent, you know, I, I was at uh, the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, and also the University of T Tennessee Health Science Center uh, College of Medicine in Chattanooga and focused on community-based interventions and particularly the role of the built environment and to support physical activity and active living. Um, and I, I've been doing that. Uh, and then, of course, the pandemic hit. And uh, I became part of uh, the team of the COVID task force for our region. As an epidemiologist, uh, I clearly understood that those who are most vulnerable were those who were um, had significant underlying conditions. Those are the ones that got in the hospital and, and, and unfortunately died. Um, were those who were inactive, those were who had obesity, those who had high, high blood pressure, um, type two diabetes, hypertension and those kinds of things. Um, so I've been doing that. And um, currently I'm working with a team of, uh, so I retired from teaching uh, in 2020, but I've continued to con uh, do research in physical activity epidemiology. I'm a part of a team uh, headed up by a number of basic scientists, many of whom are Chinese, who have, who have been in this country and, um, uh, in fact, uh, a couple of, with your last name, Wong, and um, and that's been uh, that's been really encouraging. And we were funded to look at the development of a pandemic prevention center, um, and we have 18 months to put that together and see if we can get long-term funding. So that's what I'm in the middle of doing now. So I'm not teaching as much, but I'm still engaged in in. Uh, 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 physical activity epidemiology as it relates to not only, you know, chronic disease, but the pandemic was an example of chronic disease meets infectious disease. And as, as you know, and as uh, all throughout the world knows that that combination was uh, what caused the number of uh, premature deaths and so forth. Um, fortunately, we have vaccinations, but not everybody gets vaccinated. And those are concerns of mine moving forward is that we still have to deal with the underlying conditions. So that that's probably longer uh, than the introduction than when you know, but, but the nice thing that I can kind of summarize is I have both the clinical uh, and basic science training, and then coupled that with my, my uh, training and, and, and experience in epidemiology. And it, it, it's been a really fulfilling career for me. Um, and, um, so it's, uh, you know, I can't, I, if I were to do it over again, I'd probably do it the same way. So thank you very much for your introduction and the topic on physical activity epidemiology. So it makes me wonder, what is the innovative part about your research and how is your work different from previous findings? I think the... Probably the greatest innovation, and, and is you know it's like anything else in science. We really build on others and what others have done. Um, and so I've been fortunate to be having been trained and also worked with and collaborated with people. So I, I try to bring what I think is this combination of understanding the basic physiology of of exercise and how it relates, particularly to cardiometabolic changes and trying to apply that in the context of, of, of um, promoting physical activity. And so not just in terms of trying to change behavior, but also looking at not just uh, personal behaviors, but also looking at the social environment and the physical environment, the cultural environment that people live in. 
So we've done a number of studies that I think are rather relatively innovative in that we've looked at the context in which people are uh, living and where we've been able to um, take advantage of other sectors like transportation, uh, where they put in trails, where they put in um, urban trails, as well as um, improved public transport, because people have to physically get there to get on the bus or, or the train. And so um, that I think is kind of unique in terms of bringing both personal behaviors, but also in the context of the social and physical en environments in which people live. Um, and what most interested in uh, the disparities that exist. So in lower income communities, why do they suffer such a burden of chronic disease? And in, it's not surprising, but their physical activity levels are also not as high. Their, their inactivity is, is higher um, than you find in, let's say, other higher income communities. So that's another piece that we've, um, that's sort of innovative. It's kind of, it's part of the social determinants of health, but it's, it's applied to the promotion of physical activity and understanding, if you will, the epidemiology of physical activity in, in populations. I'm sure during these years of epidemic, your field of expertise couldn't come in more handy. So it makes me wonder, what do you think about the development of this research field? And what's your prediction? Well, I think um, we continue to see um, evidence mounting. And so, for example, in the, in the midst of this pandemic, I have colleagues who are part, uh, who have published work um, at both in the United States here and elsewhere in the world, um, where they've examined um, the role of physical inactivity and risk of a severe or critical case of COVID, for example. And I think that that was a wake up call for a number of people who kind of discounted inact you know, inactivity as being related. And, but what we come to find out is that physical activity is important in, in terms of immune health, if you will, or enhancing immune status. And, uh, so that movement, as I tell my students, you know, we were made to move. And when we don't move, um, really some bad things happen. So where I see it going in the future, there's, again, more and more evidence every day. So, for example, recently there's papers that uh, and studies that have been published about the role of physical activity and cognition and um, Alzheimer's disease and de preventing dementia. And, uh, th you know, it, the, whole, the whole field is just taking off in e each of these sub areas. So, you know, again, we were made to move and it affects all uh, multiple systems. And um, so I think in, what's really exciting is the number of young investigators who are now um, moving into that field. And it's also exciting to see a, at least in, in the US and elsewhere. I, I know I have colleagues in China in, uh, uh, that, um, that, are, that their institutes or ministries of health are putting money towards um, research in physical activity promotion, but also epidemiology and the importance of, of measuring that. And I think that's where we are right now is that we are at a, on a we're at a brink of learning how to apply some of the technology so that we actually get valid and reliable information about physical activity. So through sensors and so forth, like accelerometers, which is much more objective than let's say asking an individual, you know, are you active or not? Or did you do, what did you do? You know, how, what do you do for your physical activity? How often do you do it? How, how hard do you do it when you do it? And, and that kind of thing, which as you know, um, response rates can drop and also people can not tell the truth. So, so, um, so the, 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 the technology and the science is moving forward. And I think during the pandemic, uh, people recognized very clearly that this is an important behavior and we need to continue to monitor.
We went to Fast Hills. We wish you and your fellow colleagues the best of luck on your redirection, and I hope the best of luck for the future younger scientists out there as well. And thank you again for joining us. You're welcome. My pleasure. It was good talking with you.